Hi folks, I'm Mr. Fullerton and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about springs. Specifically, we'll talk about Hooke's Law and the elastic potential energy that's stored in the spring. So to begin with, our first objective is going to be to use Hooke's Law to determine the elastic force on an object. Secondly then, we'll calculate a system's elastic potential energy. So let's dive right in. The more you stretch or compress a spring, the greater the force of the spring. And this is typically modeled as a linear relationship known as Hooke's Law, which says that the force on the spring, Fs, measured in newtons, is equal to some constant that describes the spring in newtons per meter. So the larger the spring constant, the larger the k, the stiffer the spring, times the displacement, x, from the equilibrium position. That's not the total length of the spring. That's how far you stretch it or compress it from its rest or happy or equilibrium position. Now the negative sign in the formula just means it's a restoring force. If you stretch the spring out, the force wants to compress. It wants to bring it back the other direction. That's what the negative sign mean. It means. It's just a direction. Now it's important to realize, although we call this Hooke's Law, it's not actually a complete law of physics. It's an empirical relationship that holds true for most springs over a fairly wide range of their displacements, their extensions or compressions. But it's not 100% accurate all the time. It's a model that we use. So although we call it a law, it's not really a law. It's more like an empirical guideline. Let's see what we can do with this. To determine the spring constant, what we'll do is we'll take a spring at its equilibrium position and we'll stretch it or compress it and we'll stretch it a certain amount from the equilibrium position and measure the force that was required. Or we'll apply a certain force and measure how much it's displaced. Then we'll do another force and measure its displacement again and again and again to give us a graph of force versus displacement. To find the spring constant then, we'll take the slope of this graph. The slope is going to be rise over run. In a case like this, if we start with our two points on the line itself, our slope, which is k, is rise over run, which is going to be change in force over change in displacement. In this case, our change in force will be 20 newtons minus 0 newtons, or 20 newtons, divided by the change in displacement, 0.1 meter minus 0 meters, or 0.1 meter, which is going to give us a spring constant of 200 newtons per meter. So the slope of a force versus displacement graph gives you the spring constant in newtons per meter, the k value, the constant that tells you how stiff a spring is. We could also find the work done in compressing or stretching a spring. To do that, the same way we did when we talked about work previously, we take the area under the force displacement graph. In this case, if work is our area, it looks like we have a shape of a triangle here. So the work is the area of the triangle, and if you recall, the area of a triangle is found using one-half base times height, which is going to be one-half. Our base length is 0 0.1 meters, and our height is going to be, well, we go from 0 to 20 newtons, so our height will be 20 newtons. So one-half times 0 0.1 meter times 20 newtons, which gives us a total of one newton meter, or one Joule. So the work done in compressing or stretching a spring is the area under the force displacement graph. And in this case, we have the shape of a triangle, so it's one-half base times height. And we should usually see a triangle, a linear relationship, because this linear relationship is described by Hooke's Law. Force of a spring is proportional to the spring constant k times its displacement. Let's see if we can't put this into practice. The table here shows the elongation of a spring given various applied forces. Plot force versus elongation, then calculate the spring constant of the spring. Okay, well we have our data table here. Our next step is going to make, be making a graph of force versus displacement. I'll jump right away to the graph where I've plotted my points, I've labeled my axes, and I've drawn a best fit line through my data points. From here, we want to find the spring constant. That's going to be the slope of our line. 
So the spring constant k is the slope, which again is going to be the rise over the run, or in this case, change in force over change in displacement. And as my, I pick my points here, I'll pick points on the line, not specific data points, but I see up here at this corner, I have a point at a displacement of 1.5 meters and a force of 6 newtons. And also at the very beginning, I have a 0, 0 point. So this is going to be 6 newtons minus 0 newtons for force divided by 1.5 meters minus 0 meters, or 6 newtons over 1.5 meters gives us a spring constant of 4 newtons per meter. Fairly straightforward problem. Another sample problem, if we have a 10 newton force that compresses a spring 1 quarter meter from its equilibrium position, calculate the spring constant. Well, here we can go to Hooke's law, and we'll just look at the magnitude for now. The force of a spring is equal to k times its displacement from its equilibrium position. Therefore, k is going to be equal to the force of the spring divided by its displacement, or 10 newtons over 1 quarter meter for a total of 40 newtons per meter. So we can calculate this graphically or analytically. Now, if we do work on a spring to compress it or stretch it, we're doing work on that spring. If we do work on it, what we're doing is we're giving that spring energy. That's stored energy in the spring because if we let go, the spring will do work back on something else. So the work we do on a spring is equal to the potential energy stored in that spring. We can find the work done in compressing the spring by using our understanding of work. Remember we said earlier that work is the area under the graph. In this case, if we look at the force versus displacement graph, remember that the force from a spring is given by the formula or the relationship kx by Hooke's law. It's linear. So if we want to calculate the area of this triangle to get the work done in compressing the spring, that's going to be 1 half base times height, which is 1 half. Our base, our displacement, is going to be x. And our height here at the highest point is going to be equal to the spring constant k times x. So it's 1 half x times kx, or the area of this triangle equals 1 half kx squared. And since that was the work done in compressing or stretching the spring from its equilibrium position, we can say the potential energy in a spring is going to be 1 half k times the square of the displacement from the equilibrium position. So we have derived the stored potential energy in a spring using Hooke's law and our graphical analysis method. And we can use this formula as well. For example, a spring with a spring constant of 4 newtons per meter, so k is 4 newtons per meter, is compressed by a force of 1.2 newtons. What is the total elastic potential energy stored in the compressed spring? So we want to know the potential energy in the spring. We just learned the potential energy in the spring is given by 1 half kx squared. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't know what x is. But we can use Hooke's law to find it because we know k and the force. So using Hooke's law, the force on the spring is kx. Therefore, x must equal the force of the spring over k, or 1.2 newtons over 4 newtons per meter for a displacement of 0 0.3 meters. Now that we know that piece of information, we can go solve for the potential energy stored in the spring. The potential energy in the spring now, 1 half kx squared, will be 1 half times our k, 4 newtons per meter, times the square of our displacement from equilibrium, 0 0.3 meters squared, or about 0 0.18 joules. So a two-step problem there, but still pretty straightforward if you remember your formulas for the force on a spring and the potential energy in a spring. Let's check out a couple more before we finish up. An unstretched spring has a length of 10 centimeters. 
When the spring is stretched by a force of 16 newtons, its length is increased to 18 centimeters. Find the spring constant. Well, we should probably convert these to meters, but just to show that we can do these in other units, let's find the spring constant in newtons per centimeter. We know that the force on a spring is equal to kx. Therefore, the spring constant k is the force of the spring over x. The force is 16 newtons. The displacement from equilibrium, well, if it started at 10 centimeters, and when we apply the force, it stretched to 18 centimeters, its displacement, its change from its rest position, its equilibrium position, must be 8 centimeters, or 2 newtons per centimeter. Note that that's not in SI units, though. If we wanted to do that in SI units, we would have written this as 16 newtons over 0.08 meters, which would then be 200 newtons per meter. Okay? Let's try one more. A spring with the spring constant of 80 newtons per meter, so K equals 80 newtons per meter, is displaced 0.3 meters from its equilibrium position. Find the potential energy stored in the spring. Well, right away we can go to our formula for potential energy stored in the spring. Potential energy in the spring is 1 half Kx squared. Substitute in with units, that's going to be 1 half times 80 newtons per meter times our displacement from equilibrium, 0 0.3 meters squared for a total of 3.6 joules of energy stored in the spring. Hope this was a good start and helpful to you to uh, start learning about springs. If you have more questions, need more help, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.